Um, I just want to say again, welcome to everybody who's here this evening. Uh, good evening. This is the um, Gold Country Coalition EPA Brownfields Assessment Public Meeting. And I'm glad you could make it this evening. It should be an informative event. The purpose of tonight's presentation is to understand the potential for remediation of formerly industrial sites in Nevada County to increase public interest and public official interest in cleaning up these sites effectively and to prepare plans to address sites where contamination is identified. Members of the coalition are the city of Grass Valley, took the lead in this latest grant, the city of Nevada City and Nevada County. Uh, the SEER Fund is hosting this evening's presentation. The SEER Fund is a place-based organization committed to the land and people of California's Sierra Nevada headwaters. It relies on the principles of science, stewardship, environmental justice, and policy advocacy to further its mission to restore ecosystem resiliency and build community capacity. My name is Greg Thresh. I work with the SEER Fund, and I'll be the moderator for this evening's public meeting. So the Gold Country Coalition was awarded a series of Brownfields grants. Well, actually, the city of Nevada City was, um, Grass Valley has, and then this latest uh, coalition grant. Uh, but there have been a series of Brownfield grants beginning in 2009. Tonight, we're going to hear about the work that the coalition grant of 2017, the work that they've accomplished. And a lot has happened. So um, I'm looking forward to it, to hearing about it. Um, our panelists are Tom Last, Grass Valley's Community Development Director, Jason Meir, a Civil and Geotechnical Engineer at NB5, Carrie Monahan, the Program Director at the Sierra Fund, and Eric Boyce with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Their presentations will be followed by a Q&A with the panelists. So this evening, um, you have two ways to participate. Um, the first is you can use the QA feature of Zoom to ask questions or make comments, which I will field and direct to the panelists. Uh, we will be using the chat feature tonight only to provide links to resources. So please use the Q&A feature if you wish to participate this way. Uh, you may type in questions or comments um, as the presenters are talking and these will be answered at the conclusion of all the presentations, or you can simply wait and ask the question um, when the actual Q&A begins. And um, the second way you can participate is you can make comments and questions directly to the panelists using the raise hand feature of Zoom to put yourself in a queue for speaking. Uh, if you're on the phone or on a phone and not on a computer, you can use a star nine to raise your hand and a star six to unmute yourself once I acknowledge your turn. If you are gonna raise your hand to speak, we ask that you prepare your comment or question and that you take no more than one minute. And I will give you a time check at 45 seconds. So let's get started. Um, the first presenter this evening is Carrie Monahan. Uh, Carrie, is, Carrie Monahan is the program director at the Sierra Fund. She designs and directs research to fill critical data gaps in water quality regulation, abandoned mine remediation, and prioritization of conservation efforts. She earned her PhD in forest resources and hydrology from the University of Washington in 2004. She helped lead the first community-wide brownfield assessment in Nevada County in 2005 for the city of Nevada City, and has been working to address the impacts of the gold rush on ecosystems and communities in the Sierra since then. Carrie will address the history of contaminated mine sites as a context for the cleanup efforts in um, mining communities of the Sierra Nevada. So Carrie, um, it's, so, it's yours, go ahead. Thanks so much, Greg. That was a really lovely introduction and it's great to be here with you all. I have the envious position of giving you some of the background that I wish I had when I had started um, working on this topic with experts like Jason Muir and others that helped me learn about the Brownfields program and also about the impact of the gold rush um, that it has had on our communities. So as Greg mentioned, um, the Sierra Fund is a nonprofit. We are based in Nevada City, but our mission is Sierra wide to restore ecosystem and community resiliency in the Sierra Nevada. And that means uh, restoring resiliency from the impacts of the California gold rush for the uncertainties of the future so that we have the most resilient ecosystems and communities that we can. 
But in order to do that, we start with this fundamental question of what happened here. Understanding uh, where we live, work, and play is critical to understanding how to steward this place. So our community has a rich history as a thriving, productive gold mining community. And in fact, Nevada County was the richest and most famous gold mining district in the state. That has left our state, the gold rush has left our state with tens of thousands of abandoned mines. So on this slide, you see two things. You see red dots where the mercury mines were in the coast range. And those yellow dots are where the gold um, mines were in the Sierra Nevada. In general, um, mercury was mined in the coast range and brought up to the Sierra Nevada and used in both hard rock mining and hydraulic mining to help uh, recover the gold from those different processes. So that's what I just said is that in general, there's two types of mining that took place here. And in fact, hydraulic mining was invented here and then went on to be used all over the world. The impacts from the kind of mining that was done here is the result of uh, what we see today. So hydraulic mining is where there was power washing away the hillside, to put it bluntly. And mercury was used, and though they tr the miners tried to recover it, it was largely lost to the environment. Um, as a result, we can have unstable features like um, you've probably seen um, from uh, the hydraulic mining. Sometimes there are shafts associated with that. That's in, in comparison to hard rock mining, which is more quintessential what people think about when they think about mining. And that's where this mineral rich material with gold in it was brought to the surface. And then in order to get that gold out, that material was pulverized and gold was removed, but it left these piles of tailings or waste rock on the surface that can have high levels of other materials in it like lead, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, those are some of the things you'll hear about today. So the takeaway message is that mercury was brought here and these other metals are naturally occurring, but were brought to the surface and exposed as a result of the mining practices. So I hope that helps you follow along as Jason takes us into some of the details later on. Uh, you may already be aware, but we have a number of fish consumption advisories in our community, and that is from that legacy mercury contamination. The Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment issues these fish consumption advisories because of the mercury contamination uh, from, from the gold rush era. Simply put, large fish that um, are at the top of the food chain can have dangerously high levels of mercury in them, like bass, and if you eat a lot of them, you can be exposed to that. So before going fishing this spring or this season, check out your fish consumption advisories for that water body. This is obviously a map more specific to our county, Nevada County, and it has a number of dots on it. Each one of those dots is a um, mining symbol where mining took place. And the Department of Conservation has since estimated that there's over 2000 abandoned mines present in Nevada County. So what this really means is that anytime we buy property or go through development, we should find out if there was mining that happened there because it could really affect our plans. Uh, today, mining contamination presents toxic exposure risks and complicates our local redevelopment plans. Uh, most importantly, abandoned mines are not remote sites. They are located where we live, work, and play. So uh, in summary, the, um, how do abandoned mines affect us today? Well, each one of them can have physical or chemical hazards. Physical hazards are like open shafts, unstable areas. Chemical hazards are exposure to heavy metals. Abandoned mines can also affect our property values, present liability issues and development cha challenges. What do we wanna do about it? Well, um, leaders like Tom Last have allowed us to uh, look at ways to revitalize our communities with these cleanup grants. So we need to clean up the abandoned mines and having the US EPA have this um, funding for us allows us to access some of that, uh, those resources. But we all need to raise awareness about abandoned mines and incentivize others to take on this important work. 
So like I mentioned, the EPA Brownfield Grant Program provides funding to help communities assess brownfield sites and if contamination is found to clean up those sites. Brownfield sites are properties that are underutilized um, because it is or may be impacted by a hazardous substance, petroleum product, or other pollutant or contaminant. And the benefits of the EPA funding is that it's a catalyst for smart redevelopment or revitalization, and it promotes community involvement and attracts investment in local neighborhoods. Like Greg mentioned, our communities have received a series of community-wide and cleanup brownfields grants dating back to 2006. And today we're here, about, here to hear about the 2017 coalition grant, but I'm also excited to tell you that um, a proposal was submitted in 2021 for more assessment activities. And that's one of the reasons we're excited that you're all here today, because continuing to have that public involvement is key to the success of these grants. Uh, the coalition um, is made up of the city of Nevada City um, and Nevada County and led by the um, city of Grass Valley. The assessment team is made up of uh, Jason Muir from NB5, myself from the Sierra Fund, our partners at Sierra Streams Institute, which have done a fair number of these assessment and cleanup grants uh, for City of Grass Valley and City of Nevada City and Geocon. So we are continuing our outreach efforts and community involvement is indeed needed to help prioritize where to do these assessments and where uh, redevelopment is needed. So your input is very welcome. The current grant will be closed out after regulatory review and approval of the final two cleanup pl plans. Um, and we're here to learn about the process and the assessment results. And if you have any questions that you think I can help you with, I would be happy to. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Karen. So um, we are having a little bit of technical difficulties this evening with, uh, uh, Eric Boyce and actually Tom Last to being able to do a video share. So there are they are on the telephone. Um, and Carrie, um, would it be possible for you to pull up Eric's slides so that people can see them? I've got that uh, teed up. No, okay, no, perfect. But I think that Tom is meant to give us a few comments in advance of Eric presenting. Oh, okay, terrific, great. Um, so Tom. Um, can you hear? Are you uh, online and ready to go? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, let me, may I introduce you briefly before we sure. launch in? Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, so uh, Tom Lass is the community development director of the, for the city of Grass Valley. And Tom has worked in the planning field for 36 years, 19 of them in Grass Valley. He has an MA in rural and town planning and has managed multiple EPA Brownfields grants since 2010. Um, Tom will talk about uh, why the coalition did these assessments and why revitalization planning is relevant to the development in Nevada County. So Tom, thank you so much for, for um, organizing or making this happen. And um, if you could uh, tell us a few things about it. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Again, I'm Tom Last, Community Development Director for the City of Grass Valley. And um, this 2017 um, Environmental Protection Agency uh, Brownfield Grant was the fourth Brownfield Grant managed by the City of Grass Valley. This, this one we're currently working on is considered a coalition grant because we teamed up with both Nevada City and Nevada County to come up with a more comprehensive plan to look at um, brownfield sites in our community. And again, the primary purpose of these grants are to focus on properties that are have been impacted by historic mining. And this is particularly important on infill lots within the city limits. Um, and then those, those properties that are adjacent to the city limits or urban areas, which are planned for urban uses. Um, again, we, we have a, a, a broad level of mining activity that has occurred in our community. And a lot of people don't know, but it, it affects properties in the middle of towns, in the middle of our cities particularly. So that, that is the reason we've applied for these grants over the years to try to identify those properties and these mine scarred lands, because one of the things that happens is it creates impediments for, um, for landowners to redevelop or reuse those properties. And um, the, con the idea is to, those, those also potentially pose risk to humans and, and, or, and or the environment. So 
the idea of these grants is to identify these properties and with the hope of either clearing those by, through a, a series of what's called their technical reports that, that Jason may get into, but basically we identify these properties that have potential contamination. Um, ideally, we can clear them through a series of maybe um, through what's called phase one or phase two reports. We do some minor testing. We can identify that there's no issues. Or in the case, if there is an issue, we prepare cleanup plans through, and we work, we work through state agencies to obtain approval of those plans. And Jason will get into the, some of the details of the plans that, that we will be looking at. But again, the idea is that um, we prepare these cleanup plans and what that does, it creates a path for landowners and um, to develop and, and reuse that land. And it eliminates a lot of the bureaucratic hurdles, the cost and time, time that it's sometimes this is a very costly process for a landowner. And if we can take that one hurdle out of the way and, and, and give a landowner a path forward, how to move forward with your development, that, that can then add value and potential redevelopment opportunities for that property owner. And one of the second goals of this coalition grant was we, were, we wanted to work with Nevada County Health Department also to see if there were opportunities to have them approve less contaminated sites rather than having to go through the, you know, sometimes very costly and unpredictable process with the State Department of Toxic and Substance Control Board. They're, they're the agency that reviews these cleanup plans and ultimately approves them. In the past history, when uh, in the past, Nevada County did have um, staff that had more expertise on some of these more minor types of projects. So they're able to do that, but because of staffing levels and other things, um, they don't have those resources today. So part of this grant was to try to work with them to see if there was a possibility at some point in the future, we could start taking some of those simpler plans, those cleanup plans um, back to the local jurisdiction to try to avoid the, the process of going through the state um, department of toxic and substance and control agency. And um, just in conclusion, one of the things that, um, you know, once we get these cleanup plans approved, if it's a city owned property or county owned property or, or local jurisdiction, there is money available for cleanup through the EPA. And also sometimes locally, there's other, there's multiple state agencies that have funds available for that can help pay for these cleanup. But again, that's if it's a private sector. Um, more recently though, the state has been looking for, there are some opportunities besides just low interest in the past, private sector developers had to either, they, the only really mechanism that they could help pay for this cleanup, which sometimes could be very, very costly, would be low interest loans from the government. But now there are some, we're starting to see this breakthrough a little bit where there are some, some funds available for the private sector, private nonprofits, such as Habitat for Humanity. We just received a grant working with them for, for doing some assessment and potential cleanup on a project that they are working on in the city limits. So they have access to actually potential cleanup money. So that's that's a good thing for, for the community to get these properties cleared and cleaned up for the protection of human and humans and the environment. So hopefully that will continue to, there'll, there'll be those continued opportunities. Also, if, if they're, they're low income, um, disadvantaged communities, there are some more funds becoming more available in those type of communities that the private sector and then you know people that team up with private nonprofits um, potentially have access to. So that really concludes my comments. I just wanted to give a general overview of that grant and um, what we've done and some of the goals of that. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, so are, is Eric going next? Is that a, the order of things tonight? Yeah. I was a little confused. Okay, good. Sorry, I got a little bit mixed up. Um, so yes, yeah, so uh, the next presenter panelist we have is Eric Boyce. Um, Eric Boyce is a Brownsfield project manager with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. He focuses on identifying opportunities and coordinating resources with eligible entities to redevelop uh, Brownsfield sites and other impacted sites into community and or environmental assets. And tonight he'll talk about funding and resources to help communities with assessments and cleanups. So Eric, welcome and thank you so much for, for being part of this this evening. Oh, great. Thank you, Greg, and, and thank you, uh, uh, everyone, for the, the invite to, to be able to talk to me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Great. So, I, I um, you know, as, as was mentioned, I, I can't see the actual slide, uh, but we'll make it work. And I, I assume my title slide is up now, and I guess it's a good uh, metaphor for our overall prog uh, program. 
whenever you come across a, a, an impacted site, there's always issues, there's always concerns, but the, the nature of our program is to uh, try to figure out a way uh, to get it uh, to where uh, the community uh, champions uh, want that site to go. We really, we really do try to find a way uh, to get the yes, we do whatever we can to get our resources towards these sites. Um, and if I can go to the next slide, the, this next slide kind of summarizes, I think, uh, pretty succinctly the the focus of our program is uh, the, the brownfield has already been defined, so I won't uh, spend time uh, rehashing that. But I did want to say that our the statute that we work under, the regulations and um, and the statutory requirements that we work under specifically includes mine scarred lands uh, within the brownfield definition. So it's not a stretch at all. And I do want to mention that if anything is beyond what we can do in the in, in the brownfields program, we also can connect you. Uh, with other resources within our Superfund program to address the site and to, uh, you know, to move a site forward through other avenues besides brownfield sites, which are typically sites with lower level contamination that aren't that aren't causing an immediate uh, risk uh, to human health or the environment. So on the left, you can see uh, these are a few example sites that we have uh, from around California. On the left um, is is the are the pre cleanup conditions of a site, and on the right are the the post cleanup. Uh, conditions of a site and this is really what we do in a nutshell we, we clear clear away whatever issue uh, exists at the site kind of make a clean slate uh, for whatever redevelopment option uh, the community wants and you know whether it's a soccer field as is below or a, you know actual bare soil clear soil that could be reseeded for ecosystem function through stores through affordable housing and and the like and I'll go through, through some of those details in, in a few minutes um, uh, quickly on the under the next slide, uh, it kind of discovered uh, describes uh, on the left. There's all the different funding programs that we have within uh, EPA's programs: so cleanup grants, multi-purpose grants, assessment grants, revolving loan fund grants, job training grants, and the two on the bottom are are are, are non-competitive uh, state and tribal response program uh, uh, work that we have, but also targeted brownfield assessments, which is uh, I'll highlight today too so keep in mind there are uh, competitive national uh, grants that we have but there's also local more discretionary funding that we have and if that local uh, more discretionary funding that we have that can help develop a project and can, can help move a project into being grant funded and on the right for those of you that aren't familiar uh, with the redevelopment process um, these are really the steps that are that our program um, can help uh, push you through for a brownfield site from Site identification through assessments, as Tom mentioned, the environmental site assessments. Uh, there's cleanup planning, uh, reuse planning. Uh, there's actual cleanup remediation work, and then uh, our program can actually get you kicked off, uh, kick started into the revitalization phase, uh, phase of, a, of a project. And this is a really good time to be interested in brownfields because with the bipartisan infrastructure law, there's uh, 1.5 billion dollars that have been added to our program nationally over the next five years and there's a link i believe that that's provided that that provides some more uh, details on that and and we can talk over uh specifics later if there's uh, questions on that uh, you moving on to the next slide there's a whole lot of programs there you saw on that uh, on, on the bubbles on the circles in that previous slide and there are a lot of resources that we have uh to move a program forward and i find it easier to 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 kind of say what we can do as a whole rather than trying to fit different activities under a certain program or project. Uh, what I would encourage all of you to do is af after tonight, if you're interested in exploring Brownfields, is to uh, talk with us, talk with me about your specific site conditions and interests, and you know, I'll work with you to help move the site forward, help you identify what makes the most sense, and then go into further details in our program where, where needed. But here's a list um, I think you all can uh, can read it and the, the, the massive range of, of work that we can do um, within a site, uh, a brownfield site. And uh, within the grants, we can find inventory, help you create an inventory target sites of the of the highest potential for reuse. Uh, we can work with you to get community support, community outreach, get community input for visioning on where that site can go. Um, even some, we can do preliminary site design to help move cleanup uh, planning and, and assessment planning in the right direction. So the, the reuse is targeted effectively. Um, as mentioned uh, previously, we could do assessments and, and cleanups. Um, 
we could also do a range of, of reuse planning that's listed here with financial modeling for for sites that that may or may not be effective based on business business ideas uh, that are presented for a site. Uh, we could look at co-benefits of the site for a community to help you know convince your uh, city councils or mayors or communities say, is there going to be more income? Or there's how much money could this project being it bring into a community if it was if it was redeveloped? How many jobs could be created? Environmental insurance could be purchased. If you if you're curious about an area and it and it is a brownfield, you could look at the water, electric, road, uh, infrastructure, wastewater, drinking water, and infrastructure to that site to see what might be needed to, to move a site to where you want it to go. And then uh, lastly there, and we could work with you to help, besides our funding, help you work with other agencies, help you identify sources of funding, sequence redevelopment projects appropriately so you can uh, move the site where you want to go. Uh, because with redevelopment, Oftentimes, the biggest killer is timing of a project. If there's long periods of time where, where, where the project isn't moving forward, you can lose interest from investors, you can lose interest from businesses, and so on and so forth that want to move in there. So we can work to sequence things to move, to move a project through to redevelopment very quickly. Um, uh, next slide, please, is uh, first, uh, uh, next, rather, I want to uh, clearly let you know who is eligible uh, for all grant types. And states and tribes, local units of government, any any regional government entity, joint powers authority, so on and so forth, uh, and nonprofits, all of all of those entities are eligible. And if you're just talking about assessing a site, not necessarily going in and doing cleanup, uh, if you're talking about doing assessment, doing planning, uh, figuring out what the potential could be for a site, uh, that work can be done on private sites so long as it's sponsored by one of these entities and this question comes up again a lot so i'm going to say it uh, again one more time so everyone's clear that uh, a privately held site can be uh, assessed and explored within our program um, for cleanup work to be done for cleanup grants to be received one of these entities has to own the property so uh, just as you're thinking about ideas uh, after this uh, uh, seminar tonight just keep in mind all sites private and uh, uh, publicly held, uh, tribally held, uh, could be uh, uh, something that, that our program can assist. Um, very quickly, I want to hit uh, a few of the specific grant types uh, onto the next slide with assessment grants. And, and here's a list of the activities uh, that I've previously mentioned that could fit under this type of grant. So I won't go into great detail here, but what I want to do uh, mention to you is the, the level of funding that we have in these grants. And historically, it's been up to $500,000 for a community-wide assessment grant. And new this year was a, a larger state and tribal assessment grant up to $2 million. But with, uh, with bill funding coming in, the, 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 the ceiling on these projects are going to go up. And we're not sure how much they're going to go up, but it's going to be above $500,000 and then you know, probably easily doubling uh, that, that uh, maximum amount. So because of that, you know, sites and ideas and projects might be more worth your while to consider with a lot more funding available. Uh, moving on to the, to the next slide, and assessment grants are, are nationally competitive, but this, uh, the target of brownfield assessment, moving on to the next slide, is not nationally competitive. That's something that, that, that you could talk to, to me about and uh, discuss your, your situation, and, and we could get uh, funding for that side. It's a very quick, uh, simple online the application and within a few weeks we can get back to you to let you know uh, whether or not that site can move forward within our targeted brownfield assessment program and we do have funding available for it and it's a great program it, it really is you do phase one assessments phase two assessments and you can do some preliminary cleanup planning and and cleanup reuse planning as well uh, so it, it can it can really help you get your arms around the site and a lot of entities go through this program and then uh, have enough information to be competitive with cleanup grants and other assessment grants. And as Tom mentioned, we we have a targeted brownfield assessment going right now in the city of Grass Valley uh, with Habitat for Humanity. And uh, a few years ago, we had one up in Nevada City with the Champion Mine. Um, so we we were very familiar with the area, and and we, and and we have other projects north and south and east and west of there in the foothills. So um, you know we're familiar with the area. So please uh, check in with me if if you want to explore. Uh, potential sites uh, for this program. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, this I put in here because it's, it's, it's key to point out that you, 
you have a brownfield site, you think it's contaminated, it's been sitting there for years, there must be a problem with it. Well, not always. Uh, in fact, about a third of the time uh, after the assessment work is done, meaning looking at the history of, of the site, trying to identify what potential contaminants might be there, and then actually going in and sampling and sending it to a lab and getting the results uh, the, for the full assessment process, um, about a third of the time, the site's cleared and you can move on uh, with redevelopment. And assessment sometimes also can let you know what type of redevelopment that you can have at a site. You know, for example, if you want to do a hiking trail versus homes, there's a different level of, of, of uh, contaminants that could be left on that site. So th this program can help you move forward with figuring out uh, what type of redevelopment it might be ready for right now, or if you add some cleanup funding and resources, what potential other, uh, you know, higher and, uh, you know, more uh, locally uh, beneficial for, you know, sales tax and the economy and all that uh, could, could come into play. Um, moving on to the next slide, our cleanup grants. And uh, again, these cleanup grants, uh, I mentioned them briefly before, but you could do planning uh, for the cleanup. You could do reuse planning. You can actually do the remedial work and all the community engagement and uh, input uh, requests that you need uh, to get this work done. And uh, I'll emphasize this again, the applicant must own the site uh, for cleanup grants, for assessment grants, and for TBAs, the applicant does not need to own the site. Um, there is a cost share uh, with this, uh, 20 percent with these types of grants, uh, but uh, rural communities, uh, disadvantaged communities, uh, disproportionately impacted communities have been successful in getting that cost share waived. And again, the past amounts of this grant have been up to $650,000, but with the bill funding coming in, with our, our next solicitation coming out this fall, who knows how high it's going to go, but it could be, you know, uh, our, our announcements are saying up to $10 million, uh, but we'll, we'll see when the, the, the official announcement comes out in the fall, but it will be in the millions of dollars uh, available for cleanup grants. Uh, moving on to the next slide, here's a link. Uh, uh, for the eligible redevelopment planning activities. I won't go into detail on them, but here's a list. Um, and it's easiest to say that if you're not sure what you want to do at a site and you want to explore all the reuse options that are available, our program can help you explore anything <laughs> that you can think of uh, to help move that site towards redevelopment. Everything listed here, everything I just uh, described previously. So really sky's the limit here. Uh, next slide. Um, here are more resources, uh, more links for you uh, that I wanted to highlight um, with uh, our overall U.S. Uh, Brownfield site website. There's a listserv on there. I, I recommend if you're interested in this program, you jump on that listserv and announcements will be sent to you when, when key information comes. There's also a cleanups in my community site uh, that you can go on to and you can help you identify areas in your community that have received Brownfield funding in the past or have been worked on uh, from a regulatory standpoint from us, uh, from the uh, from the state uh, Department of Toxic Substances Control or the Regional Water Quality Control Boards. Um, it helps you identify, you know, what existing sites. It doesn't mean that there's not all the sites, uh, not all the brownfields in your community, but ones that have a history to help you start looking at, at, at where to move forward if you're interested in this program. We also have other links there that that can help you uh, identify, you know, other key issues of your community of. Uh, environmental justice uh, screening tool we have helps, helps to look at a, a range of risks that are being uh, that are that are present in your community on a on a percentile basis compared to the state and to the country. And uh, Enviro Atlas actually helps you overlay even more information. It's, it's, I recommend you go on these sites and check them out. And if you have questions, you'll give me a call or, or shoot me an email. I'm happy to go through them with you. And lastly, you know we do given mine, mining sites. Uh, sometimes they're large and sometimes it's difficult to clean them up to a level of, of, of residential reuse or even commercial reuse, but solar um, is something that could be considered. So there's information there. We call them bright fields, you know, brown fields that are turned into, uh, into solar arrays. So that's something to consider as well um, as you're thinking about reuses uh, for your sites. Um, the next few slides, I could, we could just uh, thumb through very quickly. Uh, just identifying the different types, and then there's some examples of, of, of projects that we've done for the, for a given type of, of of reuse here. We have affordable housing work that we've done. Uh, there's environmentally friendly transportation uh, 
any any range from transit oriented development to put in the EV charging stations are a great idea for uh, for communities you want to get uh, people out visiting uh, your community from elsewhere for tourism. You know, getting EV charging stations can help expand the network and. And there's a lot of resources there from the state and from federal government to, to build those. And, you know, former gas stations, uh, idle gas stations are a great uh, opportunity there uh, for EV charging stations. Uh, rural and tribal health clinics, which is, a, you know, of course, a major issue. Uh, community parks and open space. Um, uh, that These are all eligible reuses for, for former brownfield sites and, and renewable energy, as I mentioned. Uh, putting in, these are, these are a couple of projects that we've that we've uh, been involved with here in the region on the north is in, in Marin County on the south is in Nevada. Uh, we helped with the assessment work for the, uh, a very large uh, concentrated solar project out there. And the last slide, um, I want to just uh, let you know if you are interested in, in renewables and learning more about that, there's a great link for our Repowering America's Lands initiative uh, that can help you explore ideas there. And I believe uh, there's a few links to our regional website, uh, to the, the, the bill funding, the, the bipartisan infrastructure law funding that was included. And the, the, the other link is, um, I wanna emphasize again, that for those of you that are thinking about this might be of interest to you, you don't have enough information or time or, or wherewithal to put together a full federal grant package where we have targeted brownfield assessment and we have land revitalization uh, planning assistance funding. Uh, to help you get your arms around a project, help you uh, find out more about a site to see uh, what what type of reuse would be needed or could could happen there, and what type of cleanup would or would not be needed. So, uh, kind of like easy entree uh, uh, programs into our overall brownfields program. So, uh, please, uh, with questions at the end or or after this, please contact me if you if you have any questions or want to discuss anything I, I mentioned here further. Thank, Thank you, you. That was very the, much. The last yeah, thanks so much. Um, I did, um, Eric uh, mentioned a few, quite a few resources. I put two of them into the chat. I didn't have all of the links that he talked about, but the, the EPA and the bipartisan infrastructure law fact sheet is up, is a link there, as is the, um, the EPA free technical assistance brownfield and land revitalization fact sheet. But um, if you go to the EPA's website, um, most of the links that are all of the links that Eric mentioned should be there. So um, yeah, thank you again so much, Eric, for giving us a, a kind of a overlook of uh, how the EPA functions, how it funds helps communities clean up by providing funding. So the uh, the next, okay. yeah, thank you again. Um, so this the next uh, presenter will be Jason Muir. Jason Muir manages in B5 as part of Holders and Coles Nevada City Environmental Division. Jason is a California registered civil engineer and geotechnical engineer and holds a master of science in environmental engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. He's been in the industry and with the firm for 25 years. And Jason will talk about the sites considered in the Brownfields Assessment Grant. What, what was the result and what happens next? So the heart of the presentation, Jason, thank you so much for all the work that you've been doing over the years. And um, really looking forward to hearing what, what the latest, uh, latest news is. So it's all yours. You bet. Thank you, Greg. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. OK, I'm going to share my screen. And um, are you seeing the slideshow? Yes. yes. OK, good. Um, Eric, thank you. That was that was really good. And I, I've got to say, everybody, thank you for being here. The resources that Eric showed um, are are really fabulous, especially in Viral Atlas and some of those other tools that are um, really tailored to environmental assessment. It's like having a, a Google Earth that, that is that has so much more resources in it for demographics and for uh, cleanup projects and regulated sites and all that. Yeah, if anybody is interested, it's it's free online. It's a neat resource, so you should you should check it out. Um, I'm going to uh, spend uh, about 20, 25 minutes looking at what have we been doing with uh, with EPA funding in the last few years, and we have been focusing on um, 
Nevada City and Grass Valley. This is a coalition assessment between the two cities and the county of Nevada. And this area, our community, is uh, it, it's a set of very productive, very rich historical gold mining districts. And uh, you know, there's not much obvious evidence of that um, around, but the, the legacy of the gold mining is, is everywhere if you know where to look. So I'm going to kind of give a brief overview of how we, how we look for that stuff and how we, how we mitigate it. Um, it's not something that we just started doing. Um, I've, been, I've been working on mine land cleanup for over a quarter century. And um, these are some of the sites that I and other people have, um, have addressed over the years. And um, a lot of times the site assessment and the cleanup is triggered by uh, a residential subdivision or a proposed commercial or industrial development or some other kind of change in land use. And then the County of Nevada says, hey, wait a minute, there are mines on your property or your property is impacted or possibly impacted by historical mining. So you need to work with the California EPA Department of Toxics to assess it and then potentially clean it up. And that's what we do. So some of these sites are funded with private development dollars. And uh, when we're lucky uh, and, and we have US EPA funding for specific sites, we are able to push this forward, even though there, there, you know, there isn't money available for it from other sources. So the EPA funding is really key for, um, uh, you know, for making our community a better place. I'm going to focus on the city of Grass Valley and and then land that's unincorporated in the county just south of the city. Um, Grass Valley is going to annex this area uh, in the very near future, and so. We, we used a lot of the current grant money for addressing properties that are coming into the city or that are already in the city and, and you know, just really need cleanup and redevelopment. We, uh, along with the two cities and the County of Nevada and the EPA, we selected 11 properties for this uh, study. Uh, they uh, comprise almost 400 acres. And like I mentioned, most of them are in the Grass Valley area, but we did have the Nevada City Airport and a couple of other sites that are north of here um, that, uh, that are off the map here. Um, so we assessed 11 properties and seven of those were uh, needing cleanup plans. And so we prepared seven cleanup plans for about 230 acres of property the cleanup plans characterized about 150,000 cubic yards of mining contamination, which is a lot. Um, to put it in perspective, it would cover uh, to a depth of a foot, uh, you know, over 70 football fields. And so this stuff is, you know, there's too much of it to just haul it to the dump. And it's way too expensive to, uh, you know, just scoop and run and be done with it and never think about it again. So we have to be creative about how we clean it up. And um, sometimes that means that we're uh, consolidating it and putting it under a cap. And uh, sometimes it means that we're using a land use covenant to uh, have mine waste remain in open space, as long as it's not a threat to human health or the environment. Um, but there, there's enough of this stuff around that um, you have to, you know, you, you can't take the old fashioned approach. You have to be creative with it. And so, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at this area in, uh, in Southern Grass Valley in a little bit more detail to kind of show you how we do it. Um, the, uh, the issue that we deal with is that the mine tailings or waste rock or contaminated soil, um, it has heavy metals in it, like Carrie mentioned. Um, typically, it's arsenic and mercury and lead. The arsenic and lead came from the gold-bearing quartz veins the mercury was imported to recover the gold. And these sites aren't, um, they aren't the mine sites. These are sites that are impacted by nearby mine sites where the waste was transported. And the transported waste, is, it's, it's from um, surface water runoff and stream transport or from uh, dust aerial transport. Um, and so 
the, the, the big mining complexes, uh, you know, we've assessed some of those and other people have assessed some of them. But what we're focusing on here is trying to redevelop, redevelop land that, that is next to these spots that's been impacted by them. So um, this next side, side is, the, is the same area. It's the same view, but it's in 1947. This is an aerial photo from uh, USGS. And it helps us understand it, you know, back in the day, you know, at the end of the mining era, what did it look like? Where were the um, contamination sources? And I've, I've circled a few of them here in yellow, where, um, you know, this big one is the uh, sand dam tailings impoundment at the state park. And this site has been assessed um, with DTSC and the Regional Water Quality Control Board. And the, you know, this area is fenced off. It's a known contaminated area. We aren't seeing uh, waste transported out of this area anymore, but it happened. And the way it happened back in the day before it was buttoned up is you know, creeks flowing through it. And this is Little Wolf Creek that basically went along the edge of the uh, sand dam area and um, transported waste down the creek into the, you know, the main Wolf Creek. Um, this is uh, an historical um, irrigation conveyance that isn't even there anymore. But anecdotally, um, we've heard from the old timers that, you know, oh, when, when, you know, during the big rainstorms, that used to flow milky white because it was full of mill sands, it was full of these light colored tailings. And um, so they ended up on other properties, uh, flowing down the streams and then being deposited. The, the, a couple of our sites are located up here. Um, this is another one that's impacted by these alluvially transported tailings. This is the, uh, the little habitat site down here that uh, Eric mentioned that um, US CPA is currently working on uh, cleanup so habitat can build houses. Um, it gets complicated because after the mining era, all the infrastructure came in and we have the freeways and the roads and the shopping centers. And so a lot of these old conveyances are gone. They're not there anymore. And how did this stuff get here? Um, you have to go back and do the historical research and, and figure it out. And that's, you know, that's the, the um, kind of the sleuthing part of, of these Brownfields projects. Um, this is a close up of that 1947 photograph and it shows the you know, the incised channels through the mill sands and the sand dam. And, um, uh, you know, this is the parking lot where you go to the visitor center and here's the hard rock trail. And it's safe to use the, the state park and everything's been assessed and it's been approved by DTSC. But back in the day, um, if you look at, you know, another part of this, this old photo, um, the, you can see those light colored sandy tailings in Wolf Creek. And it was just kind of a, you know, a common occurrence back then. If you look at pictures of Deer Creek in Nevada City or Wolf Creek or anywhere, you'll, you'll find them full of mine waste. And after um, that transport stopped, all of the stuff, or a lot of it washed down into the Delta and it's gone from our community, but you know, there are still legacy spots that are, are a real headache. They, um, you know, science-wise, they're a health risk and development-wise, they throw a wrench in the whole smart growth uh, effort where we have a site that's in the middle of town and it's, you know, it could be uh, affordable housing, but instead it's this vacant contaminated idle piece of land and then you know, you have uh, homeless people camping on the mine waste or you have kids riding the dirt bikes through it. And um, it's, we're just happy that EPA funding is here to help us out with this. Um, the alluvial transport's not the only mechanism. Uh, we've had a few sites this past year where we're also dealing with aerial deposition. And so this is a, um, well, it could be, you know, it could be like the, you know, South Auburn Street area of Grass Valley. It's not, but it, there, there were a lot less trees back then. We had dusty conditions, especially 
around the mine sites because you have these stamp mills that have you know, 100 pound metal stamps that are smashing rock and making dust and, and um, fine sand. And that dust gets blown downwind and then it drops, uh, it drops on um, the ground surface. And um, over time you have a few inches of, not a few inches of dust, but a few inches of, of topsoil that have been impacted by the heavy metals in that dust and the metals have absorbed into that shallow soil and they present a health risk. Um, not just dust, um, vapors cause a problem also. This is another um, stamp mill with a battery of stamps here, crushing the ore and making sand. And then as Carrie mentioned, the mercury was brought in from the coast range and it was used to uh, dissolve the gold, to amalgamate the gold. And that amalgam was then cooked in a retort. And this is a, a small one, but um, you can see in the diagram here, you, you, you put this clump of amalgam in the retort, you heat it up. Um, the mercury, which was quicksilver, and then it was amalgam because it mixed with the gold, it vaporizes. And a lot of the mercury comes out this tube and it goes into this water jacket to cool it. And it gets dropped into some kind of a recovery bucket. And the gold is left in the bottom of the retort and that's what everybody's after. But the process wasn't perfect. It wasn't super efficient. Mercury vapors were lost in the atmosphere. And then just like the dust, they floated downstream. And so we have a dusting of higher mercury concentrations in surface soil downwind of, this, uh, of the processing areas. Um, how do we investigate this stuff? Um, we dig trenches. Um, this is a typical exploratory trench with our typical geologist, Brian here, uh, taking soil samples. And um, you can see this little uh, lens of, of stuff here, you know, in the middle of the wetland, there's a normal sediment. And then there's uh, what you can see in here. This is, this is mine tailings. Um, and um, close up, it's just the same fine sand that's got, uh, you know, heavy metals in it. And that's what presents uh, the potential health hazard. And um, in some cases we see really thick deposits of this stuff. This uh, particular trench here had about six feet of tails. And in this particular wetlands that we've been assessing with EPA money, um, the, uh, th th there's about 20,000 cubic yards that, that have come down from a tailings pond back in the mining days during storm events and deposited into the wetlands. And so um, we take samples. We may, from this particular site, we may have 300 samples. We do statistical analysis on those samples. We do human and ecological risk assessment under different uh, land use scenarios to figure out what's acceptable and what's not. And um, that all gets reviewed by uh, the California DTSC. Um, this site is uh, the Empire Meadows site, which is part of the current grant. And um, we've been through the whole process. We had to go back out because what we would like to do is um, keep this wetland as open space and restrict it from future development or future excavation or, or disturbance, but it is a good habitat. And our ecological risk assessment showed that for most uh, species, it didn't present a hazard. Um, it did identify that, that bug eating birds were potentially affected by the lead and mercury in the tailings. And so we had to go back out and do what's called a validation study. And we collected bugs and, and you know, stuff that birds eat. And we contracted with a specialty lab to analyze these little critters for uh, lead and mercury and methylmercury. And then we plugged that data back into our equations and um, demonstrated that, that there's, there's not a significant risk, that's based on the actual site data, there's not a significant risk to that trophic level. So this is going to be reviewed by DTSC uh, in the next month or so, and we're hopeful that we can 
uh, work this out where we don't have to, you know, tear up the wetlands and, and remove everything to develop the site because that would be a little environmental disaster in itself. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, just just run through a few other sites here. Uh, the Berryman Ranch site, it, you know, it has the same um, uh, tailings issue because of past irrigation of orchards and, and pasture land. And it's a beautiful piece of property. Um, portions of it are slated for residential development. And our role on this is to determine where the tailings ended up by the irrigation and then to work with the civil engineer on the project, the designer to uh, you know, encapsulate the stuff in areas where it's not going to present a risk to uh, future uh, property owners and their families and, um, and then place land use covenants in the areas where the tailings are gonna remain in place um, so that they won't be subject to, uh, you know, to future use. Um, one of my favorite sites is, is uh, up, up here by um, Club Sierra on Berry Hill. It's, it's uh, the former Hill Sulphurette Works. And this site is highly contaminated. Uh, a Sulphurette Works is a, um, an ore processing facility that, um, that everybody sent their, their troublesome ores here. And sulfurets are basically gold bearing ores that have a lot of arsenic and lead minerals in them. And you can't just stamp them and amalgamate them or treat them with cyanide to get the gold out. You had to crush them and roast them and oxidize them and add different chemicals. And what you ended up with is this purple sulfuret waste that's very high in arsenic and lead. It's, it's federally and California class one hazardous waste. And then you also had um, vapor dispersion problems because of that roasting process. And right now this land is, you know, it's just a vacant eyesore. Um, it's got this purple hazardous waste um, on both sides of Matson Creek. Matson Creek is running right through the middle of it and it's in a box culvert that's failing. And so eventually when that box culvert fails, um, you know, it is gonna be a water quality issue. And we have seen, uh, you know, people camping out there um, and, you know, doing, you know, potentially unsafe things on the, on the waste area. So we've applied for, uh, for DTSC funding actually to, um, to clean this up. So hopefully we're in the running for that. We'll hear in the next uh, few months. Um, Boma Erickson Toms has another sulfuret dump on it and this one is on Bennett Street. It's right across from uh, the Bennett Street Meadow. It's a beautiful bird sanctuary area. Um, one of the last you know, pieces of the, the original Grass Valley. Um, it's a beautiful spot. Uh, it has a, uh, an approved cleanup plan now, so we can encapsulate that, that, that toxic waste. And then it has hot spots where we'll scoop them up and consolidate them in, and encapsulate them. And I don't know what's gonna happen out here. It's a valuable piece of property for conservation and for uh, development right at the edge of Grass Valley. And so whatever happens, um, the good news is, is, is that we've, we were able to get our arms around how to clean it up and how much it costs. And that's all because of uh, US EPA funding. This, a uh, couple more here, I'm almost done. Round Hole Shaft property is a really cool historical site. It's, it's on Whispering Pines Road in uh, Brunswick. And it was the place where the, um, uh, the, the a, a specialized rock coring uh, procedure was developed. It's called shot coring. And the miners were able to take these huge, you know, four foot diameter, cylinders of bedrock out of this 3000 foot deep hole um, with, this, with this new technique that they invented. And you've probably seen these things around town um, in, uh, at the state park and at the mining museum. And they're beautiful, they're just neat chunks of rock, but they also brought up uh, waste rock and shot rock and um, 
and not processed material, but mine waste that has heavy metals. And in this photo here, um, one of our guys is sampling it. And so this stuff needs to be consolidated and capped before the property can be developed. And again, EPA money helped us figure this out and um, it definitely put us ahead of the game. Um, La Barbados North was one of those 30% that Eric mentioned that doesn't need cleanup. We assessed this, it was full of mine claims, but all of those claims were basically just exploratory. And, and so this was able to be cleared. Uh, the property just south of that is part of an old um, mining complex um, that has some really neat historical um, features on it. The, the bullion shaft and the Alaska shaft and, you know, really big, uh, big mine excavations. Um, the waste from this property is all going to be consolidated and then placed underneath a, uh, a parking lot that, that, and we designed the, you know, the pavement cap and all that kind of stuff and groundwater monitoring and um, land use covenant. And, and this plan was all approved by, um, by DTSC. So it's ready to go um, to, uh, you know, be annexed by the city, get on the tax rolls and uh, be put back to use. So that was definitely a success story. Um, Freeman Lane is a property that the city acquired and not a mine land, but we used a little drill rig to um, collect samples around a set of old tanks and determined that they were clean. And so the city can rest easy about acquiring this new property for offices and or corporation yard. Um, as I mentioned, the old Nevada City Airport was cleared. Um, uh, we assessed the bulk of this property and determined that it was um, that it was clean and we don't know what's going to happen to it, but it helps the city of Nevada City plan for, uh, for the future. Uh, perhaps my favorite one was the Wolf Creek Trail. Uh, this was a, a little project, but um, the city is planning and designing a trail that extends from the the existing Wolf Creek Trail on the southern part of town, uh, all the way to the Loma Rica development. And we did historical research and found out where the old mine features were, and then went out and sampled the mine features and or sampled the soil in the, in the trail alignment and uh, determined that they were clean enough for a construction worker scenario and for a trail scenario. And so that helps the community trail project get off the ground. And um, I'm really looking forward to, um, uh, to walking it someday. It was neat just walking segments of it and um, realizing how connected everything would be when this trail is built. I think that's it. I, I appreciate your time. And I, I, again, I wanna thank EPA for, uh, for funding this project. And uh, if anybody has questions, there are some phone numbers and um, emails up here. And uh, the Sierra Fund website is also a great resource. And um, I am gonna, I think, I think uh, Greg will probably share this later. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, it's probably time for questions. Great, thanks so much, Jason. Um, that was a lot of information. Um, yeah. And some really properties I'd never heard of. Um, so uh, uh, now is uh, we're gonna open up to Q&A, question and answer and comments. Um, if you would like to uh, post questions in the Q&A, you can do it that way. If you would like to uh, speak, um, just go ahead and use the raise hand uh, option and we will recognize you in order. Um, so I'm gonna go through some of the questions that we got here. Um, some of them were, were answered by uh, some of the panelists already. Um, would it be worth kind of asking them again, just so that it, they are uh, as part of public discussion or should we leave them at that? Like Don Ravina's question. Um, I think Tom, you, uh, you both you and Carrie apply, uh, uh, replied to him. Um, I'm not sure how do we do it. Do you wanna do that? The question was, is the EP making sure that current mining is not allowed to leave lands as brownfields without remediation? 
And the and answer I'm, is that the EPA does not regulate current mining. Um, current mining is regulated under the Surface Mining and Reclamation Act, which is either under the authority of the unit of local government like the county, or if that authority has been revoked, it's under the state authority through the State Mining and Geology Board. So try to answer that um, that way. SMARA, as it's called, the Surface and Mining and Reclamation Act, is the act that would make sure uh, a new mine has the proper financial assurances so that if they went bankrupt while they were mining, they would there would still be enough money in a bond or in an account to clean that up. Um, so things like that, it ensures proper inspections. These are sites that were all pre-SMARA, right? They didn't have those kinds of regulations. They didn't have those kinds of financial assurances. And I just really want to highlight, you know, Jason's uh, work for both figuring out what the problems are at these sites and for his solutions for figuring out what we can do with them. Uh, that's really what he's been trying to present uh, to us today. Yeah, SMARA has been around since the middle of the 70s. And so, you know, the mining era basically ended around 1950 and then 75 SMARA came into play and it was never really enough. You know, even mines that operated in the seventies and the eighties didn't get reclaimed to, you know, any kind of um, uh, reasonable status because the financial assurance wasn't enough. And the Sierra Fund actually played a big role in, in working with the Department of Conservation and, um, you know, making those rules a little bit more stringent for reclamation. Um, and that basically covers the, you know, the physical appearance of a reclaimed mine. But the, the agency in California that really holds the, you know, the cards for water quality and, and you know, contamination type issues is the, the regional water quality and the state water quality control board. Um, and so a lot of that mine permitting in, in the present day is done through, um, through the water board. Great, thank you. Here's a good question, sorry, Greg. Yeah, um, go ahead. Why, why is consolidation and capping strategy for contaminated soil and rock the default solution? I think that's a great question. I, it was really frustrating to me when I first started this, um, understanding this field. So. Mm -hmm. I'm going to write the idea is to keep it from reaching ecological receptors. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, yeah. One of the reasons is just to put a physical barrier there. And, you know, sometimes if you have a site that has burrowing rodents, you have to make sure that you've got some kind of a, you know, a clean rock layer that the, the ground squirrels aren't going to get through. Um, but the, part of it is that physical barrier. Um, part of it is water quality. If you have a soluble waste, you have to have a um, relatively impermeable cap on it. Um, if it's really highly uh, contaminated, you have to line it. You're basically building a landfill and it goes with all the bells and whistles of a, of a landfill. But a lot of the waste um, where we are in the foothills um, can be dealt with as a, uh, you know, a, uh, non-hazardous waste. And so we're not really building a landfill, we're building a containment cell that's unlined, but that has a cap on it. And a lot of times we'll put in monitoring wells to make sure that the cap actually works and the water quality is protected. Uh, don't know if I answered your question. I think that's helpful. Hmm. Um, Ray Breyers asked a question earlier before Jason, you got, we started talking about the sulfuret. Uh, mm -hmm. property on East Main. And I think that was the property that Ray was referring to. He, he said that, you know, this, this sort of Southwest of the mall, um, that there's this prime candidate for a solar farm or a park. And the question that came to my mind was, so with a, given a specific property like that sulfuret, which sounds like it's pretty highly contaminated, does that, does a level of contamination determine what kinds of remediation you can do like does that site is it could that site be turned into a park or is that the kind of thing that you need to you know do something else like how do yeah. you how how is development potential development determined by the level of contamination and the type of contamination that you find in a spot specific area yeah we're not capping that stuff it's going to cost several million dollars to remove it 
So it's a removal thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then once that's done, then what potential uses can be made of that? It, it depends on your cleanup levels. Um, if you clean it up to unrestricted levels, then the use is unrestricted. If you know that you're going to develop a, a site uh, for industrial uses, there are another set of like slightly, uh, slightly easier cleanup levels. Um, but it's a combination. You have to protect everything. It's, it's human health um, based on the land use. It's uh, ecological health if there's going to be ecological ecological exposure, and then there's water quality. And on that site, it should be cleaned up to a, a, a you know unrestricted level because the you know the appropriate use for that site is to open up Matson Creek, and the creek's going to flow through the property, and that we don't want a water quality concern there either. Mm -hmm. So that stuff has to be offhauled because of such high contamination level because. Yeah, it's very soluble. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very soluble. So it's more expensive to clean it up, um, mm -hmm. heights, but maybe also more comprehensive, like it comes all the way out. Oh yeah, yeah. If we could, if we could, you know, remove all the mine waste from the county, we'd be set. But I, I, it would take a long time. So I know that um, it, 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 a number of us. Uh, it's been mentioned that um, the coalition has applied for another applied for another. EPA grant in, in 2021. And um, I'm kind of curious, I mean, even though it hasn't been granted, the money isn't available yet, but just out of curiosity, what kinds of things are you anticipating doing with this next uh, hopeful uh, funding? We've, we've targeted, uh, you know, another set of properties. And we've also asked for money to um, used for technical assistance with planning in the Southern Sphere. Um, one, of the, one of the potential projects is um, the, uh, the, the North Star Mine, it's 750 acres of land that has gone through a lot of um, you know, different private ownership. And at once it was proposed for subdivision. And um, right now the, the mining company owns it again. And they've been talking to the city about, hey, do you want to acquire part of this property? And, you know, so what parts can the city acquire uh, that, are, that are safe for specific uses? Um, what parts are, you know, are contaminated and then are never going to be clean enough for development, but maybe we can do a bright fields, you know, have a big solar farm on it. That, that is a, you know, I don't know, that's a, that's a fascinating prospect, you know, in, in, in light of everything else, that's it's a 700 acres of property that right now, you know, have, has a lot of mining contamination on it, um, a lot of fairly dense uh, forest growth that, per, per, you know, presents a fire hazard. And it could be powering the city. It could be a big solar field. Greg, I just want to point out too that the 2001 or 2021 grant is just the city of Grass Valley. It's not a coalition. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't clear about that. Okay, thank you, Tom. Yeah, I think yeah. the EPA got away from the coalition grants this last cycle. Okay. Uh, I don't. I don't think it was an op option this time. Um, yeah, that's great. Hey, Greg, I wanted to add something uh, to the previous question. Um, uh, this is Eric with EPA on the, the cleanup question regarding the sulfurette site. And I think that, you know, then another, uh, you know, way of looking at that question, I know there's a lot of times communities are very concerned with these sites and with the cleanup process of, that happens at a site. And when it's all said and done, um, you know, how does the community know, you know, that they're safe? And, and, and part of the part of the cleanup uh, planning process, there is a risk assessment that's done and, you know, it evaluates uh, all the potential receptors that, 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 that everyone's been talking about, you know, that the cleanup plan really breaks down is where, what's the contamination, what's the level of contamination, is there a method of that contaminant to get from where it is to the environment or to the community, and then how does that cleanup plan stop that pathway, and how does that cleanup plan stop that pathway going forward, and it's really important to know that these types of sites 20, 30, 40 years ago were just left alone, because anybody that owns them was responsible for the cleanup. 
-hmm. And so something had to be done to move these sites forward so they're not just all these idle infill sites that are causing problems throughout the country because nobody wants to take them on or own them uh, because of the risk, but the people that own them didn't have money and resources to clean them up. So that's where this program really fits in to, to address all those concerns and all those problems as best as possible. And sometimes uh, the most important thing is just to keep the contaminant, contamination where it is. That's better than what it was before. It's not an ideal situation. Everybody wants all the contamination gone, ideally all the time, but the funding to do that always is, isn't always available. Because um, as Jason mentioned, it could be tens of millions of dollars in some cases to, to do that. So I just wanted to add that a uh, little feature on of this of this program and what you know, the city of Grass Valley and uh, Sierra Fund, the city of Vada City, the, the county, they, they've done a really fantastic job in addressing some of these, you know, major community concerns that have that have uh, you know been an issue in the community for a very long time. And you know, we're excited that they're continuing to move forward to uh, to address these sites and to give some um, you know to make the community safer year by year. Uh, uh, grant by grant, and and uh, we'll we'll continue to work with them as, as long as we can. Yeah, that's a good good point, Eric. Every cleanup plan is is fundamentally based on risk assessment, and I think most people might be surprised at the level of scrutiny that um, you know these technical studies are put through. You know, you'll have cleanup plans that are you know a hundred pages long without the attachments, and it's really um, the, the regulation has really come a long way. 30 years ago uh, in Nevada County, if somebody was developing a, you know, a piece of property, they would, they would say, oh, well, we'll just use a bulldozer and we'll push the mine waste back into the hole. And in, you know, in the last 30 years, the, you know, the, the county has gotten a lot better at identifying these properties. And they've worked with the state of California who you know, has a very sophisticated um, review process. When, when I write a cleanup plan, it's reviewed by geologists, engineers, toxicologists, lawyers, biologists, public participation specialists, and then the project manager. And it, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's thorough. Um, you know, just in case you guys were wondering you know, is it protective? In in, in my opinion, um, you know, I, I think they hold us to to a high standard. And, and it's always a requirement to put that all that final work out to the public for review and comments as well for our programs and for the for the state programs. So nothing, no, you know, nothing happens behind closed doors when it's all when the work's all done. It, it has to be put out as part of our grant requirements to to the community to make sure that everyone's on on board with what's happening. Right. Great. Um, so um, I think that um, Matthew Coulter has some questions that I don't really know how to answer. They're not quite germane to the, the, um, the conversation this evening. Matthew, I just want to acknowledge, you know, you can, I can see your questions. Um, I will respond to them as best I can um, tomorrow. Um, I will send you an email if I can um, be useful. Um, and I want to just allow any other people who want to ask questions before we finish this presentation this evening to do so. Uh, otherwise, um, we're going to conclude and um, call it an evening. I want to say again, thank you so much to everybody who presented tonight. Carrie, thank you so much. Jason, Eric, Tom. It, uh, this is um, a pretty um, um, remediation of abandoned mines and. Uh, contamin hazardous sites in our area is a super urgent issue and it feels good that there's been a lot of work in the past and that it continues and that's momentum is building and it feels like there are some distinct opportunities to do cleanup in our area so really looking forward to hearing what happens next and I wish um, us go ahead Carrie. Right, I wanted to remind you to put the link in to have people sign up. Um, yep, I was about to. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're on the same wavelength. Go ahead, if you, while I copy and paste that, uh, okay. if you want to talk about what's next or you know what your feelings are about uh, what's yeah. coming up. 
So Sierra Fund is in a position of um, helping with uh, community outreach around this topic. And so we're gonna put a link in the chat here where you can fill out this form and you'll receive notification of future meetings like this for future grants, um, Brownfield Community Assessments and Cleanup Grants, um, if you're interested. And if for some reason that form uh, process is too difficult or not working on whatever server you're on, you can also just get us your contact information um, through the chat um, or directly to Greg or I um, or through the Sierra Fund. We just wanna start creating um, a way to continue to keep you in the loop. Um, personally, I think that um, having the community give insight into properties that uh, they wanna see assessed is, is just vital to the entire process, but also for us to all learn what it takes to get these properties um, cleaned up is uh, really valuable as well. So it's a give and take and, and thank you. So I put in uh, two links. One is to just our Brownfields a page and then another specifically to us an information sign up form that Carrie just mentioned. It's just a great way for us to um, keep you informed. And um, so does anybody else want to make any final comments before we close out the evening? Um, Thanks um, everybody. Yeah, Jason, thank you. And uh, yeah, thank I really you very much. I really appreciate the uh, invitation. I enjoyed uh, talking with you all tonight. Yeah, glad you were here, Eric. Yeah. And um, yeah, so thank you all for joining us for this meeting this evening. And I trust you got something useful from the presentations and um, look forward to having uh, more you know, community participation in the future. And please stay in touch and we will uh, stay in touch with you if you want us to. So uh, with that, I'd just like to say good night. And again, thank you to all of our panelists this evening. And thank you to everyone who came. Good night. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks again. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.